Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, we might take for granted the things that we can tell about something just from looking at it. Let me give you an example. All of us here probably know what an elephant is, right? We know what it looks like. Uh, Maybe we've seen one in person at a zoo, maybe. Uh, Or if not, you've seen a picture. Or if you haven't, You've seen one now, okay? We know what an elephant is. It's kind of a different looking animal. Oh, it's, it's, it's gone. Um, it's a different looking animal. And, but there's a story um, to get us to think about what we can see and what we, what we can't always see. And the story goes with an elephant that a group of blind men encountered an elephant for the first time. And, and these blind men all sort of went up to the elephant and they described what an elephant was like based on what they could feel with their hands because they couldn't see it. So one of the blind men went up and touched the elephant's trunk and said, an elephant is, is kind of like a rubbery snake sort of thing. And another one of the blind men touched uh, the elephant's ear and said, well, an elephant's kind of like a, a big flat fan. And another one touched uh, the elephant's leg and said, well, an elephant is, is like a, a tall, big tree trunk. And yet another one touched uh, the elephant's tusk and said, well, the elephant is like a, a sharp spear. And someone else touched just the side of the elephant and said, an elephant is like a strong wall. And for us who can see the elephant, we know, well, none of those descriptions all in themselves really do it justice. You know, all of them are certainly right based on what that that blind person could feel at the time. But again, you you sort of need your sight to be able to to wrap your mind around what this kind of strange-looking creature really is. And this morning, we get to think about that with God for a little bit. See, I can't flip the screen ahead and show you a picture of God and say, well, we all know what God looks like because, well, we can't use our earthly eyes for that. But think about that, how we get our minds around who our God is, and what he's done for us. You know, how, do we, how, how do we measure up to God, so to speak, and, and figure that out? You know, we're talking about God revealing who he really is to us. In a way, we're kind of left like those blind people talking about an elephant whenever someone tries to talk about God. You know, someone who looks at the complexity of the human body and the different things that are built into it, uh, and they might conclude from that that, well, God is very wise. Someone else might, you know, be on a, a ship on the sea, and there's a storm, and it's scary, and that person might very well say that God is powerful, uh, and maybe, maybe also angry based on their experience. Someone else might, might have the birth of a new child. A mother might be holding her, her child and say that, that God is, is loving and giving, And someone else might experience a loss and be standing at a graveside and sort of wonder how God could do this to them. See, people can get a lot of different knowledge about God from what we experience, but and maybe they're right somewhat, but maybe they don't quite see the full picture. That's why we're thankful this morning that God hasn't left us in the dark, groping along, trying to figure out who he is. He's he's told us through his word. He's given us the eyes of faith to help us to see who he is. And this morning, that's what I want for us, is to to be able to, again, using those eyes of faith, using his word, to help wrap our minds around not only who God is, but how amazing his love is for us. Right To measure up to God and see what that means for us, really for all eternity. As we do this, we're looking at um, our text from the book of Ephesians, that letter to the Ephesians, And here, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in the city of Ephesus. And he's writing to these people basically a prayer. He's basically saying his prayer for them. And it fits really well for us because this is, you know, one missionary's prayer for his people. And it sure fits with God's people of all time. Uh, And it's neat for us to think about as we, again, try to wrap our minds around measuring up to God in this way. So he starts here. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, when we first hear that, we might say, you know, how do we, 
how does every family derive its name from God the Father? And this is one of the rare times, I think, in the Bible where it makes more sense in Greek um, because that's the original language that this was written in. And, and in the Greek language, the word father and the word family are from the same root. And, and it's, very, it's like a play on words when he says father and family. So it, it makes more sense in the original language. But the point that he's making is actually a big one by calling God father. Um, he had just brought up in this letter, again, about the different divisions that exist in the world. There was, there was Jews and there's Gentiles. Uh, and we can see it in our world today. Oh, there's human beings, but, but they're from different nations or from different cultures or from different races. And, and he's reminding us here that really there's only one God and he is the father of everyone, right? So it's, it's a breaking down of those divisions um, when we pray to our God who is the father of all, right? And when we pray to that father, um, notice how Paul says that he kneels before the Father, and we can sort of read past that and say, well, some people pray kneeling, and you move on. But you think about that. Um, it's not as common for us today to do a whole lot of kneeling. Um, maybe one of the only places that people still commonly do is, is up at the, the Lord's Supper here behind me. Um, and that's one of the few places, and, and uh, again, sometimes it's for medical reasons, people, people don't and shouldn't kneel. But, but when you think about that, you think of what that that posture might show, it really shows humility. You know, you're really putting yourself in a vulnerable state when you kneel in front of someone. And normally you wouldn't kneel to someone where you think you are better than this person. If we're kneeling before God, we're acknowledging something about God. We're acknowledging that God is way, not only way above us physically, like up in heaven sort of thing, but way above us in every possible way. Right? God is perfect, and we are not. E- even people who, who don't have the eyes of faith in the word like we do, e- even they sort of get that about God, that if, if God created the world, if he did all these things, he must be way above us. But for us who have the word, it's even, it's even more stark than that because we look and we, we realize, according to God's word, how much we fall short of what our perfect God is and what he demands of us. You know, he is the holy, perfect God, perfect in every way, and we're sinners, and we stand before him that way. And it reminds me, um, nearby here, it's closed now, of course, but Valley Fair is a theme park, you know, here in the Twin Cities. And uh, many years ago, they used to have a different mascot that they don't have anymore, and it, it will age you if you remember this mascot. But I found one picture online, it's a bad picture, but I found one picture of it online, it's this little band leader dude. You remember him? Um, his name was Oom Papa, but that's a whole other thing. But anyway, um, it used to be at the rides, there was like a cardboard cutout of him. And it would be him like sort of holding his arm out. And the whole point of it, and little kids would walk up to it, and if you were taller than the arm, you got to go on the ride. Because, you know, they had different specifications for different rides. And if you were shorter than, you know, if the little kid is looking up to the, to the hand, you wouldn't get to go on the ride. So you'd see kids coming and sort of stretching out and trying to make themselves look taller because they wanted to go on the ride, but that was the rule. You know, you had to, to measure up to that. And we think about that for ourselves before a holy God. You think about what God says in his word, like in the book of Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we're trying to measure up to God according to ourselves, we fall short, right? And there's no amount of, of stretching and, and sort of saying, well, I'm, I'm pretty good, right? I've never, I try to be nice to people, right? I try to, but even on our best day, that, that sinful nature in our heart shows itself in different ways. Thoughts, words, and actions, we do not measure up to our holy God. So in a way, even thinking about who God is and, and, and trying to figure that out is sort of a daunting proposition because it just, it might sort of remind us how we don't measure up to him. But really, if that's where we left it, if we left it there, if we just, if we just looked at the fact that we are sinners and God is holy, we still aren't a lot better than someone who's blind and, and trying to figure out just walking along in the dark because our God tells us a whole lot more than that. And thank God that he does. And we really see that in the rest of this prayer that the apostle talks about when he really brings out what we want to look at when we, when we really try to measure up to, and see who God is. 
Because he says here, in this, in, as he talks about the content of his prayer, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So God, who is so powerful that he created the world, what, what Paul is praying that God would use that power for isn't to say, um, you good for nothing, sinful human beings, I'll wipe you out. No, he doesn't, he doesn't do that. Instead, Paul's praying that he would use that power to strengthen us, that he would use that power not to tear us down, but to build us up. And, and how does he do that? Well, we're reminded here that uh, our God, who, yes, is our Father, like we had said earlier, uh, but we also have uh, something that we couldn't figure out just by looking around uh, this world, that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We couldn't have figured that out. We needed the eyes of faith in God's Word to tell us that. And here he's reminding us that that Holy Spirit is to be strengthening us so that we have God the Son, so that we have Christ dwell in our hearts through faith. So really what he's praying for is that we would be believers in Jesus, right? which, which sounds simple enough. When you're already a believer, it seems simple enough. But again, remember what a miracle that is. Whatever, remember what a miracle it is every time someone can say, yeah, I'm a Christian, it sounds like nothing, and we can maybe take it for granted, but it's a, it's a huge miracle. Um, we sang in that little Alleluia song a few minutes ago, this passage here from Romans, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But just how amazing that is, that in that message, the good news, the gospel about Jesus, that God would actually work in us that faith to believe the message itself. I mean, it, it sort of shouldn't work, but it's that, that's the Holy Spirit's power building up in our heart, right? That's what he gives us. That's what Paul praying. That's what Paul is praying for because that's what God promises, that as we uh, think about who this God is, that he's also building us up and strengthening us in our faith in him. As it goes on, he, he, he continues to pray this way, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Again, think of what Paul is, is asking here. First of all, who, what he's telling us and the Ephesians about who we are. <laughs> Excuse me. He's saying, I pray uh, that you who are rooted and established in love. He kind of uses a picture of a plant. You know, a, a plant, you know, you put the seed in the ground, the plant grows up, and the roots grow down. And the roots, of course, are, are there to, to grab the water out of the soil, and they sort of hold the plant in place. And here he's saying that we are rooted and established in love. The, the picture is that our, our roots are our God's love for us, right? They, they, hold us, um, they hold us tight in this world, and they keep us, us safe in God's love. And we continue to grow in that love more and more. So it's, it's not something that just happened like the first time we became a believer, or something like that. Like the day we were baptized, it's not that then, that was the, that was the height of our, of our faith or something like that. No, we, we continue to grow in this. We're rooted in growing uh, because of that word and because of the Holy Spirit continuing to work in us. And then as that is going on, again, he's praying that we would have power. But, but what is it that we would have power to do? Um, uh, we'll, we'll, say, we'll look at the whole section here from verse 18 on. He says that we may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So what he's praying that we would have the power to do isn't to perform our own miracles or something, um, or to have the power to you know, be successful in this life and, and, and those sort of things. It's something that it seems like you know, all this power of God, and, and you want us to do what? All this power is directed to you that we would grasp, that we would understand Jesus' love for us, right? He's saying that we would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So we're talking about measuring, and here he's, you know, he's literally talking about the dimensions, but it's not measuring a thing, it's measuring Jesus' love for us. I mean, you think of you think of that elephant I showed us earlier. You know, if, you, if they gave you a tape measure and they said, measure this elephant, it takes some work. You know, you might need a friend and, you know, you hold the tape measure and then you walk to the end of the elephant. You know, you figure out how long it is and then 
you know, you have to get a ladder, I don't know, to figure out how high and to measure all these sides of an elephant. But how do we do that for Jesus' love? How do we measure it and grasp it? How do, we, how do we put the dimensions on it in our minds? And, and really, we use the very thing that, that we've been talking about this whole time. We use that message, we use the eyes of faith that God has given us, the message of his word, to really understand Jesus' love. And you think, really, the whole Bible is the story of this. But it's one of those things that the more you think about it and the more you try to get it in your head, the more amazing it is. That God saw this world of sinful people that he had, he had created, turned against him in sin, and God didn't say, ah, eh, let's start over. You know, we can, we can do it better than this. Um, but instead, he saved the world. And he decided to send his son. And he decided to have Jesus live perfectly, unlike you and me, living perfect, sinless uh, life, uh, and then suffer and die, not for his own sins, but for ours. And that after he paid for our sins, he rose from the dead, showing us that he would give us his life, right? That we would have that resurrection, that God would give us all those things. And it's one of those things that, it's really the same story we tell every single week at church, right? The story how God loved us enough to send his son and that we're saved through Jesus. It's the same story, but every time we hear it, we're growing in it. Every time we hear it, we're kind of taking the, the tape measure, so to speak, uh, of our faith and, and measuring again just how amazing God's love is. And think of what Paul is saying here. He wants you to know the love, this love that surpasses knowledge. And you think, well, isn't that kind of a, aren't you kind of saying something that doesn't make sense, Paul, to know something that you can't know? I want you to know something that surpasses knowledge. It's sort of his way of saying, we're never going to get done knowing it. I mean, yeah, it's true. In heaven, in heaven when we're, we're there with him, when he has brought us to our heavenly home, maybe there it'll be like t- turning the sight on for a blind person. You know, the blind person in front of the elephant, who, if all of a sudden his sight was turned on, he'd say, oh, well, that's an elephant. Now I get it. Maybe, maybe that's what it'll be like for us in heaven. That God will just flip the switch for us and we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it perfectly. But until then, Paul is praying that, that we would know this thing that we can't really know. That we would keep looking and keep uh, going back to God's word and, and knowing what he's done for us. And you think about the ways that that continues to show itself in our life. I mean, just thinking about the fact that we're here today, which isn't all that remarkable for most of us. Maybe some of the mu- musicians had to travel a little farther to get here. But, but for most of us, we would think, well, yeah, I go to church. But think about it. That, that we could have been born in a place, some place where we would have never heard of Jesus at all. But instead, we're here. Instead, God has, for many of us, put us into families where we grew up knowing about our Savior. Where we were brought, before we can remember, to a baptismal font and connected to Jesus forever. It's not because we're better than someone in a far remote land who's never heard of Jesus. It's solely because of his love. Just all the ways that we continue to think and, and, and to try to grasp what we can't grasp, how amazing that love is. Finally, when, it's all, when we do that, the more we do that, all that's left for us to do is praise him. That's really all we can do. That's how our text ends. It just ends in praise, because what else can you do? Right? It says, uh, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I mean, again, think about the words he's using. He's saying, you know, it's one thing to pray to God for something, and it's one thing to imagine, just imagine what God could do for you. And you can imagine all sorts of things, but this is saying that God can do more than you imagine. The greatest thing that you can imagine God giving you, he can do better than that, whatever it is. Again, it's incredible. And when we think about his love, we just want to praise him. And yeah, we're going to praise him in different ways. Right? We'll do it with, with song. We'll do it with, with the music of brass. Uh, we, we praise him in singing. We praise him on our own uh, when, we're, when we're there with God's word. We praise him when we tell others about what he's done for us. We, we praise him in our lives as, as we live out um, the thanks that we have, the thanks that can never make up for what God has done. But it's just trying to continue our quest to grasp and put our arms around measuring up to who God really is. It's an amazing thing to think that this, this love is always greater than we can understand and, and 
our God is going to continue to, to bless us and, and do more for us than we can even imagine. We will never get done measuring up to God's love. But thank God that he's going to give us an eternity to try. Amen. I invite you then.